All righty, good morning, everyone. I'm Joel Turtle, one of the PGY-5s here, if you haven't met me. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning in orthopedics as well as in medicine. Um, and so this talk actually stems from the relatively recent release of the open AI platform, which some of you may have read about in sort of the popular media. And it's something that for me uh, challenged a lot of my preconceived notions of what AI is and how we're going to be interacting with AI in the future. And so that's kind of where my idea for this talk came from um, and why I chose it. So this is a, a quote from Arthur C. Clarke, who's a science fiction writer. And it really captures how I felt when I first started playing around with OpenAI. Uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So just this, if you can't understand the technology and technology surpasses your level of understanding, it, it feels like magic and it, and it is something that is both exciting and quite scary. And so artificial intelligence has been in the popular media for years. It's been a popular discussion point um, and uh, has been discussed sort of throughout the ages. This is an article from 2021 that was published in Forbes that talks about how artificial intelligence is going to sort of end of work, um, that AI is going to drive job loss and there's going to be some roles that are going to take longer than others for to be replaced by artificial intelligence. But in general, artificial intelligence and robots is coming for all of us and it's going to take all of our jobs. Um, and so, this article that was published in 2021 kind of defines the uh, thing that's going to keep humans in jobs as being uh, jobs in which humanity itself plays an essential part. And so kind of where each of us sees our own definition of humanity is, is probably what defines artificial intelligence. And so for me, um, my main thoughts of what artificial intelligence shouldn't be able to do, what AI can't do, would be versatility creativity, empathy, compassion, those sorts of, um, those are the sorts of things that I think of as sort of the human experience that shouldn't be able to be replaced by artificial intelligence. And then out comes open AI and I play around with it a little bit. And now I'm a little bit more scared than I was and, and excited. So what open AI is, it's a, it's a platform that was recently released to the public where you can chat with it, you can have it essentially type in whatever you want and have it try and do things. And so here uh, in black is what I've typed in. In green is what the, the AI bot gives out. And so um, this is not a Google search where it found a human's phone. This is a computer writing a poem. Uh, and it's better than I can do it for sure. Um, it also can do art. Um, you can ask it to do an impressionist painting of a spine. Uh, and I think that these are pretty lovely paintings that you can print out and put on a wall, and I would think it's pretty good. So um, pretty scary. And then probably the this is where, to me, it, it really kind of challenges me quite a bit, where I, I asked it to write a dialogue between a patient who's confused about their new cancer diagnosis and a physician who provides information about the diagnosis and empathy towards the patient. The patient says, I'm so confused. Can you explain to me what's going on? Of course. We just run some tests and discovered you have cancer. I understand how overwhelming this news must be for you. The patient says, what type of cancer is it? It's a lymphoma, a type of cancer that affects white blood cells. What do I do now? We're going to start treatment right, right away. I'm going to refer you to an oncologist. We'll be scheduling tests, creating a specific treatment plan. We're going to go get through this together. And this is all an AI being empathetic or at least pretending, showing some semblance of empathy um, that I think probably beats some of us residents when we're rounding it for it. <laughs> so to, to start in, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the history of artificial intelligence and how we got to where we are now. And so um, early artificial intelligence, the first kind of idea that we could take the human intelligence and put it into a computer and have a computer um, provide this intelligent response stems back to Alan Turing's uh, book that he wrote in 1950 called Computers and Intelligence. This is where the Turing test, famous Turing test was uh, developed where you sit a computer down or a human down at a computer terminal, the human is chatting on the, the terminal and has to determine whether the black box that it's chatting with is actually another human or whether it's artificial intelligence. 
And this was not able to, we weren't able to come close to this uh, in the early days of artificial intelligence. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, all of this computer programming was really based on sort of if then statements in, in the, the computer's logic. So it became a very task specific learning, very um, sort of party trips where if you ask the right, question, it could give this scripted response. It could look intelligent if you ask exactly the right question, um, but it wasn't flexible. Flexible, It wasn't versatile, and it couldn't do a whole lot. And so in the, the 60s, we have sort of the first robotic arm, Unimit by General Motors. It enters the assembly line um, and uh, helps kind of with production of vehicles. 1964, the first chatbot that mimics conversation called Eliza. Again, this was if-then if statements, nowhere near what we have today. Um, and would definitely not pass the Frank test. And so this led to a couple eras where not a whole lot of interest was put into artificial intelligence. And these are the so-called artificial intelligence winters. Um, and two of them are, are pretty pop popularly discussed in the 1970s and then again in the 1990s. And these were for a couple different reasons. In the 1970s, it was due to the perceived limitations and lack of benefit of artificial intelligence. These were thought of as party tricks, not helpful, not useful. Um, they just could respond to very scripted questions and weren't very good. Uh, then again, you know, there are some developers who were quite devoted in the 70s and 80s, kept working on the project um, and actually made some progress. Uh, but then again, in, in the 1990s, uh, that progress was slowed. And this was because the developers depended upon labeled data sets in order for these artificial intelligence programs to be valuable. And what that means is that an expert is going through all of the data, each individual data is getting labeled by an expert to say what it should mean to the computer. That's incredibly time intensive and incredibly costly and made it so that maintaining an artificial intelligence was not beneficial. So more recently, early 2000s, now companies start uh, getting some more uh, advances in their artificial intelligence programming, uh, deep learning, neural networks, these, these uh, ideas that we rely upon today um, start to start their development in the early 2000s. And we see IBM develop Watson in 2007. Watson then beats uh, any human in Jeopardy in 2011. Um, and we get natural language processing, which gives us the app Grammarly, if anyone's seen it. But basically, the computer now understands the, the basics of English, English language better than most of us and can edit our grammar and correct our grammar so that our publications look, um, look accurate. Um, this has been applied to Siri and Alexa and are, is now in our consumer electronics. And since 2014, there's been a pouring of investment. And so um, OpenAI, for instance, that program that I, that I showed at the beginning, um, Elon Musk and Sam Altman are two of the founders. This was founded in 2015. They pledged a combined a billion dollars between them for the this, this company to be developed, as well as Microsoft, who invested uh, over a billion dollars as well into the, into the company. And so whether we like it or not, it's kind of here to stay. Big companies, big investors are, are investing and pouring money into it. And so uh, AI is likely here to stay. And so um, I think looking at a particular task in a timeline is, is sometimes pretty helpful. And so I think chess is a good one. Um, this is a task-specific learning, task-specific artificial intelligence. And the, so the first chess program was developed actually by Alan Turing himself. It could play chess, it could not play chess as well. Um, and it took until sort of the 80, late 80s and 90s before we had decent chess uh, algorithms that could defeat a more majority of human players. Um, and IBM created Deep Thought and Deep Blue, which Kasparov, the grandmaster at the time, could still beat up until 1997 when he first lost. And since then, chess AI has continued to develop and human players haven't really gotten a whole lot better. And so if you look at the chess rating systems, the FID ratings, um, there's no real necessarily top limit to that rating system. But Magnus Carlsen, who's the current grandmaster, has a score of 2859 within sort of 10 to 50 points of his next competitors. Um, the best chess AI are now in the 34, 3500 range. So uh, it's essentially inconceivable that humans will ever be uh, AI again uh, in chess. So getting into uh, medicine, 
what do we have as far as uh, artificial intelligence in medicine? There have been many artificial intelligence systems that have looked at retrospective data. This has been in the past decade or so, uh, but relatively limited translation into actual clinical medicine. And the reason for this is that in medicine, we deal with a lot of dirty data, incomplete data, um, and setups that aren't ideal for, for computers. And so um, in these retrospective studies, the data are cleaned up and then get fed into the, the AI system in sort of a hand-fed way. And then we show whether or not this AI system um, can make predictions or diagnose a patient. Um, and it's it simply doesn't work into the workflow. And uh, old AI systems were slow, they're complicated to use, and just weren't efficient in, in the physician workflow. And so now, um, with newer artificial intelligence systems that are able to handle dirtier, uh, more incomplete data, they were moving into randomized prospective clinical trials where the artificial intelligence systems are being used in real time, in real clinical practice, with the same data that human physicians are using. And so um, the earliest adoption of artificial intelligence is in fields where the data are to some extent already clean and arrive to the, the AI or can arrive to the AI in a relatively standardized form. And these are fields that rely upon uh, images. And so radiology, pathology, GI, ophthalmology are some of the fields where, where this has been done first. And so this is the kind of conventional workflow for these AI setups. We have an input of a simplistic homogeneous data set, say a radiograph or a pathology slide. We take an expert and we annotate that data, not just necessarily on a whole slide or a whole radiograph level, but telling, showing, drawing, tracing a fracture on a radiograph, tracing the, the uh, the neoplastic cell on a, on a slide and annotate that data so that the AI can learn. And then we retrospectively look at data and see if the system works and then compare the, the, uh, compare the results of our AI system against humans. And so what we have here, this is just an example of sort of the recent research. This is from 2019, looking at lung cancer screening on CT scans. If you give a computer AI system the best sort of deep neural network, the current state-of-the-art uh, artificial intelligence system, a single CT scan, and have it search for uh, lung cancer on these scanning CT, or screening CT scans, CT will, or the AI will actually outperform radiologists at detection of, uh, at detection of cancer on this receiver operator. When you give human radiologists access to comparison CTs from previously, and you give that AI, the same comparison CT scans, it's non-inferior. And so um, we're still working, or the AI uh, developers are still working on obviously increasing the complexity of their algorithms, um, but are beating radiologists at reading CT scans for uh, neoplasm in the chest. Um, and if given access to, to uh, prior CT scans, they're at least uh, non-inferior. So that's a single example, um, but I don't want to spend too much time belaboring that point. Let's get into sort of what we have in, in orthopedics. And I guess the, the short summary here is that we don't have a whole lot. That orthopedics, despite our you know, heavy reliance upon imaging and, and radiology, um, we do not use artificial intelligence as much as some other fields in, in medicine. Um, this is a review that was published uh, last year in um, discussing spine surgery and how artificial intelligence has been used in spine surgery. And this is pretty similar to what has been published in orthopedics and the field at large. But these artificial intelligence programs are used to guide patient selection, guide preoperative workup, predict outcomes potentially, and do a little bit of uh, retrospective research. But not a whole lot has been done. And there are still, there are some pivotal trials that are ongoing. Um, but the results from those trials are, are still pending. And I'll discuss a little bit of that at the end. Um, one area that has been looked at by a number of studies um, is looking at fracture classification uh, using AI systems, um, looking at both fracture detection as well as fracture classification. Uh, we see reasonable performance of neural networks and artificial intelligence at both detecting fractures and across spine, uh, trauma, and sort of hand and upper extremity uh, 
fields. Uh, this has been uh, this has been published with sort of receiver op operator curve area under the curves in the 0.9 to 0.99 range, um, as well as accuracies in the 80 to 90 percent. So reasonable, but not great. Further, these neural networks are not great at examining orthopedic um, and predict orthopedic data and predicting complications. Um, this here is looking at in spine surgery, can we predict cardiac complications, and venous thromboembolism, wound complications, and mortality. We see in blue, artificial neural networks, and then in green, logistic regression. So uh, comparing the green and blue curves on these receiver operator curves, just really pretty abysmal performance um, and not great at predicting um, outcomes. There has been some industry support for artificial, artificial intelligence for uh, orthopedics and one of the companies that I know that we have uh, some systems in place here at the university is OrthoGrid. Um, we've all played around a little bit or at least seen it uh, in our operating rooms. Uh, so I figured that for those of us who haven't, um, this may be new to you, but um, here on the, the left two images, we have uh, the OrthoGrid system and how it, the latest version of the software is able to uh, automatically detect teardrops, automatically level the pelvis, detect the pubic synthesis, measure leg offset and length, uh, and then adjust for changes in position. You can see here the dark blue versus light blue that can detect when the pelvis subtly changes in position and automatically measure your inclination conversion. The accuracy of this and, um, and reliability of this is still somewhat under uh, in in progress of being studied, um, but it's something that, that's moving forward. Additionally, for single straight objects, the, the system can theoretically detect trajectories and measure off of it, um, providing some assistance to, to physicians in the operating room. Going into to future directions and where artificial intelligence in medicine is going. Um, Sort of comparing to that, that uh, chart that I had shown at the beginning, new opportunities for artificial intelligence in medicine look instead at data sets that are in the real world. They're incomplete, they're messy, not all the data is clean, patients read the question wrong, uh, answer the wrong way, the MA puts in the wrong data, it, it, it gets messy and it is not cleaned up. We also don't have time to an annotate every, every little piece of data that there there is. And so um, algorithms with different methods of supervision, whether that's completely unsupervised or partial supervision, where instead of tracing individual pixels or cells on the slide, you just give the final diagnosis to the AI and you can learn off that. And then finally, focusing on clinical de deployment in real time and setting up for collaboration between humans and AI. And so um, there have been a couple reasonably recent publications looking at giving computers uh, different data. Um, and so in this, uh, giving computers access to an EEG, this artificial intelligence program um, looked at EEG recordings of 104 unresponsive patients after brain injury. The neural network without supervision detected 16 patients of these 104 patients that had uh, brain activation when asked to open and close their hand and then stop opening and close their hand and found that eight of those 16 patients had, were able to follow motor commands before discharge compared with only 26% of patients who were not able to do that and 44% compared with 14% were able to function independently a year out from the injury. Um, this is not the, it's not a 100% and 0%, so it's not a perfect test, uh, but this is uh, certainly better than, than nothing uh, at analyzing the EEGs. Interesting, like, interestingly, like I mentioned, um, also leaving computers unsupervised can provide some, some interesting results. And so in this study, uh, the investigators gave the artificial intelligence program access to the first six hours of clinical data after a patient presents to a hospital with a septic shock. Uh, so it gave them vital signs, lab values, uh, and all of the data, the clinical data that the patients experienced. It then just ran. The artificial intelligence program ran and clustered the data without any supervision. We didn't tell the computer that low blood pressure was bad. It didn't tell the computer that high heart rate was bad. None of that was performed. And the AI network created these four clinical phenotypes of septic shock. And 
among those four clinical phenotypes, it found that it could predict the outcome of those patients, whether uh, including more in hospital mortality, need for compressors, things of that nature, but also it predicted the eventual treatment of those patients. Uh, so um, despite the fact that these are four clinical phenotypes of sepsis that we don't really have and is not described in the, in the sort of medical ICU literature, the computer is finding clusters of patients that are inherently different from each other and at least according to um, what, is, what ends up happening to them in the ICU, they get treated differently and perform differently. To discuss a little bit of the cooperation and collaboration between humans and, and AI, um, this was a HEDEXNet model, which is a model that helps uh, radiologists and neurosurgeons look at CTAs of the head. Um, this is an unaugmented CTA. This is the AI augmentation showing regions of interest that it points out to, to human uh, radiologists and neurosurgeons. And with the augmentation, you can see that uh, radiologists in general improve in their sensitivity and in general improve in their specificity with an overall improvement in accuracy uh, where a human with the augmentation of AI pointing out regions of interest is better than a human alone. Further, um, looking at single chest radiographs, not the best, uh, not the highest sensitivity for detecting lung cancer. Um, they put radiologists alone, radiologists in augmentation with AI and then AI alone, and found that the combination between the human and the AI was actually the, the highest sensitivity and specificity, highest in accuracy uh, when compared with either the AI alone, AI alone or the human. And so um, the, there, are, there are some big advances and, and uh, big things coming in, in artificial intelligence, but there's also some uh, major setbacks um, that will need to be addressed. Um, one of the, the main ones is, is distrust and uncertainty of, of AI, uh, particularly with this recent JAMA article on sepsis. Uh, we have the, the computer tell us that these are different groups of patients that should be treated differently. And, then the computer tells us we should do treatment X or group X and doesn't tell us why. It's hard for us as humans to, to just listen to the computer because it says so. And so one of the areas of, of research in AI is also what's called explainability. Where not only are the, the AI systems trying to, to figure out what the best treatment is, but why it's the best treat, treatment and explain to a human, and put it in some form of understanding why, what's different about that group. There's some, regulatory and medical legal uh, difficulties, as well as uh, difficulties with uh, data privacy and security, both from a HIPAA standpoint, as well as from a, an industry uh, copyright standpoint. A lot of these data sets that are used to train artificial intelligence are viewed as proprietary um, and make the applicability at different institutions somewhat questionable, uh, unless that data is able to be accessed at your institution. And then um, lastly, unsupervised learning of artificial intelligence has been tried outside of medicine. Um, I am not sure if all of you are familiar with the, the recent sort of Twitter chatbot that was uh, given unfettered, uh, unfettered learning uh, on the, the Twitter and allowed to start chatting. That quickly became radicalized into a uh, white supremacist uh, viewpoint and was taken down quickly. And so complete unsupervised, unsupervised learning by uh, computers can lead to some really negative things. And so um, there is likely some supervision that, that must happen and some, some learning. Uh, the nice, one of the nice things about um, AI is that this is, this is measurable uh, and measuring the bias in our data is something that is possible. So in the future, um, you know, we're going to have these real-world um, heterogeneous data sets that can look in real time at sort of the entirety of a patient's medical history, the entirety of their, their, uh, their medicines, all of their family history, all of their lab values, all of their uh, radiographs, all of the, the physical exam findings that, that every physician has found, um, and use those to, to generate predictions and, and models for what may happen with this patient. Um, this has not been published yet, uh, but Cleveland Clinic uh, has 
actually a built-in epic tool that is relatively new that was discussed at one of the, the recent spine conferences um, that has this epic tool that's built in it looks through the patient's chart it, it analyzes all of these variables and the surgeon in their in their note and interaction with this epic tool can propose the surgery to the tool uh, and the tool will uh, calculate a risk score uh, for various perioperative complications. And additionally, we'll suggest those complications for you as the surgeon, as well as your partners as the surgeon, and can recommend that if your partners have a lower uh, complication rate for an individual patient, recommend that the uh, other surgeon perform that surgery. Um, so, Obviously, a, a topic uh, fraught with um, a, a lot of emotion. Uh, but if anyone has any questions or comments, I'd love to take them. Doctor, so please, fantastic talk. I, obviously, I don't, I know nothing about these kind of things, as so many things, but. It seems the problem in orthopedics is largely going to be you know, garbage in, garbage out. It's like if you have some things that are very you know, widget-like, like knee replacement or hip replacement, where, where, where there are some things that are very similar every time. It's not going to do anything for like, right? No, but I, 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 I mean, so, some things where, where there is there's some part of it that that is at least similar and done thousands of times. Whereas if you take, you know, yeah, like like a revision, you know, how is it going to be able to? How are we going to be able to get the information annotated in such a way where if you have, you know, this bone loss or from a revision that you're ever going to get enough data in there that it could it could think intelligently about well, I think I think the, the main uh, the main thing that I think is important is that we're gonna have we're gonna start giving computers access to more data simultaneously. And so if you give the AI system just radiographs, it's gonna do mediocre at, at providing recommendation. If you give it access to just labs, it's gonna do mediocre. If you give it access to both, for instance, in, in the, the joint setting, I think between labs and radiographs, you would get a pretty reasonable prediction of whether it's you know, a, a septic revision that's needed in a spacer versus an aseptic revision. Or I, I think that as you get more axes on your data sets that your your information space becomes more easy, more easily di differentiable. Um, that that if you're, I mean, as a resident, if you only look at the radiograph, you're only going to get the diagnosis right some very small percentage of the time. It's it's kind of a combination of all of those. And I think that as as the AI systems get all of the data, it will self cluster and may actually find variables that are interesting to it that cluster better than we. But critically, how, how do we annotate? That's what, that's what I'm sort of saying. It's like, it's like, again, placement of a cup with a total hip where you have, you know, one screen of an AP shot of a pelvis is very different than deciding, you know, much more complex. That's plenty complex. I'm not saying that's simple. But, like, at least that's done thousands and thousands of times. And you have, you know, the human variation in anatomy. But it's all kind of annotated right there in the radiograph. But how do we annotate data sets with different kinds of information? Well, that's the harder piece. I think, I think the non-annotation is, is one of the things that's going to be moving forward, what's going to happen, is that it's, the AI systems aren't going to need annotation. And maybe we'll spit out a variable that it it shows you a measurement that it is making that it finds highly correlated. And then we get a new measure of whatever disease that we haven't thought of yet. I need you to develop 
to one of these to be able to interpret gate lab data. <laughs> that, is, that honestly would be a phenomenal one for it. Yeah, especially if you could train what we wanted and what outcomes look like and you know say this is what we our goal is, but yeah. it's huge